Mr. Garamendi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for your service. Uh, I don't know how many of these hearings we've gone to, and it always comes down to more money, and then somebody mentioned sequestration, and uh, it seems to me that with the unified control of Congress and the administration that if sequestration is a problem, then perhaps it could be solved uh, quickly. Uh, nonetheless, the money problem is likely to persist. Uh, a couple of questions, uh, just to follow up on the question about the airmen and the pilots that are necessary. I understand that the Air Force is now moving to provide or to allow pilots that are not um, officers to fly certain missions. Uh, General Wilson, if you could comment on that briefly, and uh, is it going to help solve this problem? Uh, Congressman, uh, we think so. Let me tell you our efforts today. We've got the initial uh, group of our enlisted aviators into our RQ-4 Global Hawk uh, program. We think over the next few years we'll be able to grow it so that uh, a majority of the pilots in the Global Hawk will be enlisted. We'll learn from that. We'll see if that we can take that example and do that in other areas like our MQ-9s and others, but that, that's to be determined. But we think that will help uh, alleviate some of the shortages right now. But it's, it's in the first stages. We've got the second class in training. We only have a handful of, of enlisted operators going through that training program right now. Okay. I think the question really comes to this committee and whether we're, or this committee and the Senate, whether we're gonna force this faster uh, or not, it seems to me we ought to let this go in a way that is wise, not necessarily slow, but at least thoughtfully done. Uh, the next question, if I might, uh, General Wilson, has to do with, um, I guess we want to have everything, and we want to have everything now. Uh, a long discussion has ensued about the uh, aircraft and about the personnel, but not much discussion about the uh, ground-based strategic deterrent and the multi-billions that will be spent on that. Uh, and the question arises in my mind, and I hope in this committee's mind, about the necessity of rebuilding the entire nuclear mission, all of the bombs, all of the delivery systems from Naval to uh, Air Force. Uh, and General, if you could comment on this issue, can we afford all of it? Congressman, I think we can. If we look at this, it, we look at the investment across the nuclear enterprise going forward on all the moderniz modernization programs, it'll peak at about five and a half percent of our defense budget. So it's a matter of priorities. Foundationally, what our nation provides, the nuclear deterrent provides our nation is, uh, is incalculable. Uh, it's provided 70 plus years of uh, uh, no conflict between major powers. As I look across the globe and the landscape that you talk about changing, as we see what our adversaries are doing across their force, we have no option other than to modernize. Our forces were built, many of them in the 60s, uh, modernized early in the 70s, that we're still maintaining today. That there's, there, there comes a time where we have to modernize and we've reached that. We've delayed the modernization of these programs for far too long. Specifically, the ground-based strategic deterrent. Uh, if we look at today's Minuteman 3s, which are put in the ground, and actually have Minuteman 1 parts on them, the date designed in the 50s, put in place in the early 60s, Minuteman 3 is in the early 70s, we're now having 50-year life cycles of these missiles. The, the strategic stability that they afford our nation uh, is well worth the cost and investment going forward, and I, we welcome that uh, discussion about the importance of the nuclear triad. Well, I certainly think we need to have that discussion. We need to have that discussion in detail, and it's not just about the ICBMs that are in the ground, uh, whether they need to be renewed. It's about the naval and the new uh, submarines and new bombs that go with the new missiles, uh, as well as the uh, new uh, F-21 long-range bomber and the cruise missiles. And the question for all of us is a trillion-dollar question over the next 25 years or so with the bow wave occurring within the next five to seven years. And uh, the Army needs more men and women, as does the Marine Corps. And you need more fighter pilots and uh, more aircraft. And the Navy needs new submarines and another 55 ships on top of what you already have. And where's the money? 
and the president's suggesting a tax cut of more than a trillion dollars. So we better have a big credit card. I think that's called the deficit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Walters, Marine Corps Logistics Base in Albany, Georgia, got hit pretty hard with those storms. Um, I'll be there this coming Friday. That's not technically my district, but I uh, live about 30 minutes away from that base and uh, certainly important to us. Could you uh, give me any estimate of when that uh, base will be back to fully operational status if that has not already occurred? And uh, how and why is this particular base critical to the Marine Corps? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. And uh, we're tracking that daily. Uh, I know what damage has been done to the infrastructure. Uh, we think by the end of this week, we'll have all of that uh, collapsed building and warehouses off so we can take a take a look and uh, analyze what damage was done to the uh, equipment that was inside of it so I can understand the full cost. Uh, in our uh, ongoing efforts uh, in, in 2017, we've identified at least the first cost of that. Um, your second question is when are we going to get it uh, back full up round? I mean, they're, they're operating in, in a, at a minimal capacity now on areas that weren't affected. Uh, but it's absolutely critical. That's where, uh, that's where our tanks, uh, our uh, amphibious vehicles, our light armor vehicles, and our artillery get, uh, go through depot. Uh, uh, I don't have an estimate for you now when that's going to start up again. Uh, we do other components. We, have, we only have two depots, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast in Barstow. Um, it's good that we have two because uh, if it's going to be a long period of time, we're going to have to make a decision on what what we do out at Barstow and what we don't do at Barstow to take the critical <laughs> critical things and, and move them out there. Uh, my preference would be to rapidly get uh, Albany back up running uh, at at 100 percent. Would you agree that from a from a deployment standpoint, it it is important that we be able to, to deploy from both the East Coast and the West Coast? Yeah, absolutely, sir. We're a global nation. Yes, sir. Uh, General Wilson, um, David Goldfein in uh, February, I'll quote him, 25 years of continuous combat operations and reductions to our total force coupled with budget instability and lower than planned funding levels have resulted in one of the smallest, oldest, and least ready forces across the full spectrum of our operations and, and our history. Um, your testimony was pretty close to that. Uh, General Welsh. Uh, who I think is just a wonderful leader. Uh, prior to 1992, the Air Force procured an average of 200 fighter aircraft per year. In the two and a half decades since, curtailed modernization has resulted in the procurement of less than an average of 25 fighters yearly. In short, the technology and capability gaps between America and our adversaries are closing dangerously fast. General Wilson, uh, it's clear that there are not enough fighter aircraft to sustain readiness through both pilot flight hours and line aircraft. Yet the Air Force is contemplating reducing the workforce to include the depots. Can you explain how this squares up? Yeah, I don't believe we're planning on reducing depots. Depots are critical to uh, going forward in the future. As uh, uh, General Welsh, uh, Chief 20, uh, I, will, I will also agree, is a remarkable airman. Uh, yes, sir. A, a real visionary in, on what we need to do with our force. Chief 21, as, as you've talked about, outlined the problem we have at hand. We used to pr uh, procure about 200 fighter airplanes a year. Today, we're producing less than 20. That's why 21 of our 39 fleets of airplane are older than 27 years old. To maintain those 27-year-old airplanes takes a lot of work. It takes the, the heroic efforts by lots of maintainers, and of course, it takes our depots. We have to uh, actually get more out of our depots because each time we bring in a new airplane or bring in an, air, an old airplane uh, today, they're finding things that they've never found before, whether it be an F-16, a B-1, or C-5, they're finding th things that they've never seen. So these are they're real artisans on how they fix these airplanes, and our, our depots will be critical to success going forward. Uh, one, one last question. I, I represent Robbins Air Force Base, and a lot of those men and women uh, work at Robbins. Uh, and as you said, they're, they're very skilled and talented, and, and without them, our planes wouldn't, wouldn't be able to fly today. Uh, when can we expect uh, guidance issued down to the base level on, uh, on the workforce? We hope that the guidance will come out this week uh, if, um, of what's exempted in categories to allow our workforce to continue. As you know, we're, we, 
we're still just digging out of the sequestration and the effects that that had the furloughing of our civilians. Yes. Our civilian workforce is critical, whether it be maintaining our planes, sustaining them uh, at, at, uh, at operations across our Air Force, that any reductions of that skilled workforce. And 96% of our civilians work outside of Washington, D.C. They work in our depots and our flight lines. And so we have to be able to sustain those and grow our civilian workforce. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your service. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to each of the vice chiefs for your service, uh, your leadership, and your uh, testimony today. Uh, and I also really appreciate the, the guidance that you have given to Congress so far um, in uh, repealing the Budget Control Act, ending the threat of sequestration, um, having budgets that are funded and predictable and consistent instead of having continuing uh, resolutions and uh, pointing out the real value in a base realignment and closure process to be able to direct and focus resources where they're going to be most effective for our service members and our missions. And so um, on each of those, I'd like to be part of working with my colleagues from both sides of the aisle uh, to get these things done. I think you've made a very good case for why we need to do it and why we need to do it now. For, for General Allen, um, the, the three of 58 brigade combat teams that are ready to fight tonight, I think one, uh, it, it says something about our form of government that we would say that publicly uh, in, a, in a meeting like this uh, and advertise our, our state of preparedness or lack of preparedness to um, the rest of the world. But I understand we, we say these kind of things to make sure that we're making fully informed decisions. And I hope that uh, your comments spur us to take the necessary actions to reverse this trend and to make sure that we are uh, where we need to be. I'm guessing that whatever um, analogous body to uh, Hask that exists in Russia is not talking about these preparedness levels in Russia in a public way, but, but generally speaking, could you tell us how we compare uh, if you can, in a setting like this one? Are they at three of 58? Uh, I, I got to be honest with you, Congressman. I, I don't have access to their unit status reporting. Uh, I do get ours every month, and so I have a fingertip feel for where we stand in the United States Army. And obviously, on behalf of the Congress, it's our responsibility to deliver um, the, the best readiness that we can um, at, uh, at the funding levels that we have, and every commander in the field is getting after that, as you know from Fort Bliss, Texas. Um, I, I will offer, uh, it is not all uh, doom and gloom. You know, one of the biggest impacts for us in terms of elevating our readiness above what it is today is our personnel shortages, all right? It's the first thing we're doing with the increased authorization that you have given us in the NDAA this year is to fill the holes in our current formations so that they can be manned uh, at a level to deploy ready to fight uh, despite some of the uh, medically non-deployable uh, numbers that, that we have in our force. So we are, we are uh, absolutely committed to, to uh, getting after that uh, as uh, our top priority. Let me ask you another question. Uh, what do you need above what was authorized in FY 17 NDAA uh, to meet the gaps that you highlighted today? What's a dollar amount that this committee should know about? Well, that, uh, that work is going to happen uh, next week. Uh, we, we got some initial guidance midweek this week from the Secretary of Defense on uh, how to approach this. Uh, as you know from the memo being uh, published uh, publicly, the uh, first priority is uh, that which can deliver readiness immediately in 17 and 18. Um, then it is uh, achieving a better balanced force, i.e. fill in the holes in our current formation. Uh, and then it's building the joint force that we need for the future. And we are uh, aggressively uh, working uh, with the uh, OSD staff uh, to finalize exactly what that uh, figure will look like. And we will be getting that uh, to you uh, as quickly as we can. Last question, you may not have enough time to answer, and if not, we'll, we'll take it for the record, but um, the, the tempo of the last 16 years of combat in Afghanistan and Iraq have really taken a toll, uh, certainly on our service members, on their units, uh, on their families. And uh, I'm really interested on where we are in moving to the Army Sustainable 
readiness model uh, to replace the Army Force Generation model that, that is, uh, probably was appropriate for some of our needs at the time, uh, but long term I think is compromising readiness and, and unit cohesion. I know you only have 15 seconds left. If you want to uh, answer for the record, I'd be happy well, to take that. Uh, you're absolutely correct. It is a top priority. Uh, Army Forces Command is running a pilot now uh, with units across the total force uh, using this new model. Uh, the goal is to be able to sustain readiness of our forces across time, regardless of their deployment status. Uh, and and uh, the goal is two-thirds of our force ready to deploy at any moment in time. And uh, we are absolutely getting after that. Thank you. Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And gentlemen, thank you for your service to our country and your time with us today. Admiral Moran, the preponderance of our current 274-ship Navy was constituted as a result of the Reagan-era 600-ship Navy. These ships were built throughout the 1980s and 90s. Many of them have reached or are beyond their original service life expectancy. In your best military judgment, are we building and are we capable of building, given our shipyard capacity, enough ships to not only maintain this already hazardly low 274 ship Navy in the battle force, but to also increase it to the 355 ships as called for in the latest force structure assessment? Congressman, thanks for the question. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, for the last couple decades we've been living off the, the fat, if you will, of that Reagan era buildup, but it's coming to, home to roost now. Back then we used to build up to five DDGs a year. Today we're fortunate to get two to three a year. So when you look at the math, it doesn't add up over time as that Reagan era buildup starts to decommission because they've reached the end of their life and we're not building at a rate to replace them. Uh, we have programmed in 17 and 18, as we are beginning that program look now, uh, to arrest the, the uh, decline in our total numbers. That is why we've come down since 9-11 from 316 ships to 275 today. Uh, we just have not been replenishing them at the same rate as they've been going out. So uh, we've taken a hard look at whether there is industrial capacity to not only arrest the decline, but to start to climb back out of it. And there is industrial capacity to do it. We have vendors and sub-vendors, though, that are in short supply that we have to begin to have that conversation with. So to General Allen's point, once we get past this year and the immediate readiness needs, uh, we are going to take a hard look along with the OSD to determine what the strategy calls for and the size and shape and function of this force, the joint force in the future. We're prepared, and I think we can go to a higher ramp earlier than is currently programmed, uh, but the resourcing clearly is not there. What effect will this low level of ships have on our combatant commands to safeguard and secure our economic shipping lanes, execute current missions, and answer the call should a contingent operation arise? Sir, the, today we, uh, we satisfy about 40% of the combatant commander requests for naval forces, 40%. Uh, and that is uh, why the size of the Navy we have today is too small. It's also why that small Navy is being driven at a high up tempo, a higher up tempo year after year. And that higher up tempo is driving up maintenance requirements, delays in shipyards, and our ability to get that force back at sea. So the, uh, the, the, our ability to satisfy growing c combatant commander requirements is uh, is not going to be satisfying to anyone in the near future unless we have a larger Navy. Can you expand upon why the Navy is unique compared to the other services with regards to why the Navy should invest current readiness funds into shipbuilding and the impact that that has on the future readiness of the Navy? Yes, sir. The, uh, clearly it takes a long time to build a, a capital ship uh, or, or any ship of the line. So. When we invest money in, in current year dollars or, or near year dollars, it takes several years for that, that capability to deliver. Uh, so it's, we are unique in that, in that, from that standpoint. The number of years it takes to deliver an aircraft carrier or a, or a ballistic submarine or a, a high-end destroyer uh, is well beyond the fit-up in many cases. So it, uh, it has an impact over long-term readiness if we don't invest now. 
Well, let me just say in closing, I was honored to be able to go to the RIMPAC exercise in Hawaii this past summer, and not only to see uh, our Navy at work, but to see other navies at work, because there are 27, I think, other nations that were participating with us. And I was struck by the esprit de corps of the sailors that I was with. I was struck by their commitment to the mission. Uh, and I was struck by the fact that they're doing a lot more with a lot less. But I worry that there's a time coming when even the great sailors that we've got cannot continue to do more with ever dwindling the number of resources that we're providing to them. And I, I was struck by that quote that General Wilson gave from General MacArthur. That was really uh, hit me very hard. Uh, I hope that we never, ever get to the point where we are there again, where we literally have to say it's too late. And I don't think it's too late, but the clock's ticking. It's click ticking on all of us, and I hope that we'll work together to rebuild all of our armed forces, and I appreciate what each of you do, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of you for being here today and your thoughtful and uh, certainly enlightening uh, testimony and for your service uh, to our nation. You know, I represent a district in Nevada about a dozen miles from Nellis Air Force Base, home to the U.S. Air Force Warfare Center, the largest advanced uh, combat training mission uh, in the world. And our primary mission includes testing of the nation's most advanced aircraft and weapon systems, tactical air training, advanced training on the Nevada test and training range, and the largest, the Nevada testing and training range is the largest air and ground space available for peacetime military operations. And it looks very much like the Middle East. So uh, in the summertime, we're not so lucky, happy about that, but it's good for the military. And even though we're a small state, we have the six most active duty Air Force personnel in the country. And one out of every 300 Nevadans is active duty Air Force. So it's very uh, important in our community. You've touched on a lot of issues today, but uh, um, your testimony really seems to have put into place and emphasize the importance of passing a budget so that we can plan on your side and on the private side. So I'd like to ask about uniform versus contractor. Are there responsibilities that contractors are doing now because you don't have the money in your budgets? And conversely, what are service members doing that contractors used to do because we don't have the funds on that side? Congresswoman, we've got uh, contractors involved in all aspects of um our organization. So today, for example, at, at uh, Laughlin Air Force Base, one of our pilot training bases, all it's contract maintenance. So they're doing all the flight line maintenance. So uh, uh, we've contracted that out in, uh, in, in, the, in our balancing of modernization capacity and readiness. We didn't have the funds and that's how, how parts of that blue suit may, used to be done by blue suit maintenance, now being done by contractors. Uh, and and that, that example would permeate across every unit and every part of our Air Force. That contractors are involved in some aspects of how we do operations. Um, is it too much or too little? I, you know, I, I guess I'd say that there's, it's going to depend. There's areas that, that we think should be more, in our case, Air Force blue suit maintenance or blue suit operations, uh, but we're having to rely on contractors because we don't have the people that we once had to be able to do that. So what resources do you need at, for training to increase the people pipeline? Because that really, we can have maintenance, we have equipment, but without the people and the training to do it. So what resources do you need to improve that people both pipeline on both ends? Well, we have the infrastructure for, to be able to assess and train the right people. We need the authorizations for the people and the funding that goes with it to be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, so. I yield back my time. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks again for your service. Uh, Admiral Moran, I'd like to begin with you and, and ask you to elaborate on the backlog of maintenance that we're seeing within the Navy. And I'm going to go right to our aircraft carriers. As you know, uh, the CNO has said he wants to stay on seven-month deployment schedules. There's been delays of CVNs getting to the yard. Uh, when that happens, it also has an impact on maintenance availabilities and therefore deployment schedules, 
training schedules, and now we're seeing that reverberate down to our SSN, our attack submarines, because all of this work on our nuclear ships, as you know, has to be done at our public shipyards. Give me your perspective in several ways. First of all, we are now seeing the impact on SSNs with the USS Boise now being tied up at the dock, one of our active attack submarines tied up at the dock for two years before maintenance will begin. And again, that takes a while before she gets back to the fleet and another five getting ready to be tied up at the dock awaiting maintenance again for that two year period before the first work gets done. You have that, you have carrier gaps now in the Persian Gulf. Uh, you're seeing that start to back up with uh, carriers going to the yards and then not just maintenance availability backups, but then that affects training schedules. I want to ask you this, are, are you going to change deployment schedules, lengthen them from seven months? Uh, will training times, pre-deployment workups, will they get shortened? Uh, how are you going to deal with this to make sure that all of these ships get to the yard, get maintained, get back to the fleet? If we're going to get to 355 ships, we have got to do all possible to maintain the ships that we have. Congressman, thanks for your question. It, it's a very complex answer. Yeah. I'll try yeah. to keep it okay. simple. <laughs> okay. the, uh, when we hit sequestration and furlough uh, back in 13, we saw several of our civilian sailors in our yards leave who were eligible for retirement, eligible to move on, just because they were tired of dealing with this kind of uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, in the years since then, when we've been able to hire back, we've hired back uh, in numbers that are fairly substantial. But they're young, they're inexperienced. And so today, our, in our public shipyards, roughly 50% of our civilian workforce there is, has less than five years' experience. Mm -hmm. and when we're talking operating or, or, or uh, maintaining nuclear-capable ships, mm -hmm. uh, that's not necessarily a good place to be. Yeah. What happens with something like that is take Bush, for example. Bush just came out late, 141 days from its availability. 141 days which delayed its ability to get on deployment to relieve the Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. uh, CNO has maintained and will try to maintain the best of our ability the seven month deployments and take risk by gapping in certain parts of the, the globe. Uh, when that ha in order to get Ike back here to get her started on her upkeep. Uh, Bush was late for a lot of reasons. One was the junior nature of the workforce. We had upwards of 70% of rework on Bush throughout that 13 month uh, maintenance period. Uh, so until the workforce gains that experience, uh, we're gonna continue to see rework issues. There are training issues involved, but we're starting to see some nice turnaround in, in the public yards along those lines. But, uh, but again, until we see that workforce mature, performance in the yards continues to improve, uh, and then the timelines that we put our ships in maintenance begin to shrink back to what's planned and, and can be executed, we're going to continue to see these problems. So when a carrier gets delayed, to your point, when a carrier gets delayed like Bush for 141 days, that bumps an SSN. And that, so that workforce cannot go over and work on the Boise. Mm -hmm. So the Boise's delayed and delayed. Now she's two years delayed. I used the example earlier of Albany that got delayed for 48 months mm -hmm. uh, before it came out. An entire crew lost proficiency and experience on that sub. We have the same concerns about Boise. We had the same concerns about Montpelier, which we put in a yeah. public yard just to try to offload some of this workload. So there are huge impacts to the, the place we're at and on the maintenance front, uh, on the public yards. We're trying to spread it with the private as best we can, uh, but it's, it's, going to, it's just going to take time and resources. It's been highlighted here. Very quickly, what, do you, what can you do to mitigate this backlog? Because the backlog is only going to grow. You can't gain back time. You can't gain back workforce experience to be able to accelerate that. I mean, you can hire up in the yards, but you're still hiring new people, so the proficiency there is not going to be there. How do you gain that back? Yes, sir, I, I can uh, answer that for the record. Quickly, though, it is, it is by sticking to the deployment lengths that we have so we don't wear out the equipment so much that the – when it gets back in the yards, it's got to go for longer periods of time. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Moran, you mentioned your testimony about uh, discussed aviation readiness. Um, I note that you're a 
your uh, CO VV46, and now we've moved on to P8s. They're relatively new. The Growlers uh, are Super Hornet derivatives. They're fairly new. So what class of uh, aviation in the Navy uh, is really a focus for readiness and, and uh, maintenance? Uh, the, the focus right now is clearly with, uh, with our partners in the Marine Corps on our legacy Hornet fleet and the beginning bow wave of Super Hornets who are we're flying harder and more often than we would have because of the, the issues in the, in the uh, legacy fleet. So uh, we're, it's a two for the strike fighter community is definitely the focus of our energy right now. Uh, General Walters, you want to comment on that? Sir, it's our focus also our biggest challenge and I would throw in our 53Ks, our old heavy lift helicopters and our V-22s by capacity. Those are all the three priorities for us, sir. Oh, the focus is great. Uh, everyone ran back to you on an issue regarding the growlers and the uh, OBOGs uh, problem. Can you, uh, so I understand that um, uh, physiological event teams invest is investigating a variety of solutions for the OBOGs issue. Uh, two things, can you update us on that, uh, where they are in second? Uh, do you envision that if there is a supplemental that comes to us that money 